All right, so I'm going to get us started. Um, I think we still have a few more people joining. It looks like they just keep coming in, but this is being recorded. Uh, my name is Cassie Clancy. I'm the president and owner of Pipe Reline Solutions. We are uh, based here in Caldwell, Idaho. I say here like you guys can actually see where I'm sitting. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, what my company does is really kind of a consultant and distributor for a lot of different pipe relining technologies. And I started working with Chris at CPM Pipelines about a year ago. We brought on a pressure, a pressure pipe lining product that he carries, bullet liner. Um, and then in addition to that, now we are offering pipe inspection technologies. So this is kind of new to us, um, Pipe Reline, my team. But this is something we're really excited about because this really helps us when we get inquiries about pressure pipe problems, being able to really pinpoint the problem without a, a municipality or an entity, a city, whatever it is, um, spend millions of dollars repairing things that they may not need to repair. Um, with that said, I'm going to pass this over to Chris. Oh, a couple housekeeping items. I'm more of just kind of the moderator on this. So we like to keep this interactive. I We do have a lot of people on the call today, but I love you guys. If you have a question, put it in the, the Q&A box or raise your hand. I'll be moderating that while Chris is going over things. I'll jump in when you guys have questions. This is meant to be kind of a flowy conversation and not just a presentation. So bear with us. We plan 30 minutes. We might go a little over, but regardless, it's being recorded. So if you guys can't stay on, I will be sending this out following up the presentation or the, the chat. So Chris, I will hand it over to you. Great. Thanks, Cassie. Appreciate the opportunity to be back on <clears throat> your webinar. So my name is Chris McDonald. I'm the president and owner of CPM Pipelines out of Phoenix, Arizona. So we've been in business about 14 years, and we've really focused on pressure pipe inspection and pressure pipe rehab solutions over about the past 11 or 12 years. And what we do is we we kind of focus on asset management with clients and, and kind of a holistic approach to how to best determine the condition of the assets before then spending money, as Cassie mentioned, to rehabilitate or repair, re rehabilitate or repair pipes. So what we're going to talk about today are some of the kind of innovative new inline inspection tools, pipe scanning, external tools that we have through a partnership we developed with a company called The Quaint out of the Netherlands, which started probably about four or five years ago. And then over the course of the last few years, we've got it in, introduced to the U.S. market and found a lot of great partners like Pipe Reline Solutions um, and some other agents across the country we're teamed up with, as well as contracting partners around the country to assist with projects and also provide our uh, rehab solutions. So again, our, our main partner for our inline inspection tools is a company called The Quaint out of the Netherlands. <clears throat> they introduced a, a lot of these technologies back in 2014, spent a couple of years validating the technologies working with companies or uh, industry um, companies like Wetsys and KWR, which are similar to the Water Research Foundation here in the United States. So they developed the technologies, validated the technologies, and then commercialized the technologies in about 2016. So since then, they've performed probably close to 1,500 kilometers or 1,000 miles, 1,100 miles of pipe around the world and just brought the technology through CPM pipelines to the U.S. a couple of years ago. And we're just really getting started and started performing a lot of our first inspections over the past few months and have a lot of inspections on the board for the coming year with the technologies we're going to talk about. So this is kind of the problem everybody faces when it comes to asset management. So getting visibility on the problem is the primary issue that most people are having because all the assets are buried. So getting visibility on buried pipelines is a challenge. And if you don't, you tend to make investments too late, which means after the pipelines are already in kind of a failure mode, um, too early before the pipelines need to have the investments made, or you spend entirely too much money investing in the asset when a lot of that asset maintenance could be deferred to later. So that's what we're really focused on is, is trying to pinpoint the locations where you have problems, 
make a simple point repair in one of those locations, identify a broader area of concern that might be 1,000 or 500 or 2,000 feet that you want to do a full rehab, and then not focusing your money and your efforts and your energies on good pipe, which most of the time, probably 85 to 90% of the pipes that we inspect are in good condition. So there's three different technologies we're gonna to kind of touch on today. Um, the primary technology we use and we're doing a lot of force main inspections is our inline tool called the Aquarius tool. We have a second tool that collects a lot of the same information, but specifically for water main inspections and the sensor placement's a little bit different and I'll explain that. And then we also have an external pipe scanning system that's also based on the same technology, which is primarily ultrasound that we can scan the exterior of a pipe during like an opportunistic moment. For example, if a, if a utility had a main break and they wanted to go in while they're making the repair to the main break and collect wall thickness information, we can do it at that time while the pipe's exposed. So the Aquarius tool you can see on the right, it's basically a soft foam pig, which gives us a lot of advantages over traditional electromagnetic or rigid tools. So this was the first company to introduce a technology built around ultrasound. Most of the technologies that have been available historically have been either electromagnetics, remote field, near field, or magnetic flux type technologies, for example, the gas and oil sector. So ultrasound is a really good technology for determining wall condition, wall thickness, or structural density, but there wasn't a platform to deploy it internally in line to do long distances through complicated pipeline geometry, for example. So this gives us that option now. We perform a comprehensive inspection in a single run. And what I mean by that is we have multiple sensors on board and every single run that we perform collects all the information. So we don't have to do multiple inspections to collect different packets of data. So it's non-destructive. Um, unlike, for example, with an asbestos cement inspection, one of the primary ways to inspect those pipes is to cut out a sample, send it to a lab, perform a phenolphthalein dye test or perform a phenolphthalein dye test in the field, which requires the pipe to be excavated, cut out, repaired, and tested. We don't have to remove any pipes or do any type of destructive work to collect the data. So that's very unique. Chris, we do have a question about um, butterfly valves. How do you handle those within a pipe inspection? So butterfly valves is kind of a complicated conversation to have. So I'll try to touch on it just real quickly right here. And then we'll probably talk about it a little bit later. But with it being a soft bone pig, obviously it cannot pass through butterfly valves. So the issue with butterfly valves, 90% of the time when we're talking to a client about performing inspection, when we ask the question, if the butterfly valves we're talking about are operational and working, either they don't know or they are not working. So generally speaking, the butterfly valves usually have to be addressed as part of the overall inspection and asset management approach. And if they're in poor working condition, not working, or they don't know if they're working, that's probably one of the first things that needs to be addressed. And if they're not operational, getting those replaced, and there's ways to swap those out with other types of valves or even not valves at all, where you can do a temporary block that is a whole different conversation that are much, much less expensive and still give you the operational control that you would have with a butterfly valve that typically by the time it gets installed and you are and you have to use it, it likely isn't gonna work properly in the first place. So that there's it's a long conversation to have, but these tools can't go through butterfly valves, but that's something we generally address with some capital improvements that need to be made to the pipe even before we would perform an inspection. So again, what, what's really unique about this technology versus say electromagnetics, electromagnetics give you one data point, which is interference in the electromagnetic signal to keep it simple that identifies a defect in the pipe. That information then has to be validated using another technology, which would be typically an ultrasound sensor, and they simply compare it to historical data. 
So with the UT, we can actually get absolute wall thickness information on lots of different materials. For example, asbestos cement, we can see delamination between the cylinder and the concrete core and pipes like PCCP or bar wrap. We can get wall thickness information on ductile, cast iron, PVC, polyethylene, HDPE, stainless steel, carbon steel, and fiberglass reinforced pipe. We can see delamination that occurs between the multiple layers in the structure. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So the systems available from eight inch all the way up to 54 inch, we can handle reductions in diameter up to about 35% as a general rule. So for example, if we're inspecting a 24 inch pipe and there's a section that reduces down to 20 and then it opens back up to 24 inch, we do that in a single inspection run. We don't have to remove the tool and put a separate tool in. So that can all be completed in a single run. And we can go through very complicated pipeline geometry without getting tools stuck, such as um, one to one and a half diameter radius, 90 degree bends. How long would the pipe need to be out of service to perform these inspections? So the pipes only are out of service temporarily, if at all. So if there's a launch tube assembly already available or an outlet with a valve, we can connect a launch tube assembly directly to that. And we don't have to take the pipe out of service at all. Um, if there isn't a launch assembly, we may have to take the pipe out of service ahead of time before the inspection to simply install some sort of piping configuration to allow the tool to be launched with the system in service. We actually use the system's pumps to propel the tool through the pipe. So it's not tethered. It's not attached to anything. Once we get it in the pipe, we turn the pumps on and the pumps actually push the pig through the pipe to collect all the information. So great, great question. So the, the primary sensors on board are the, the UT or the ultrasonics or ultrasound technology, which you can see in the diagram in the center. We're basically sending a, frequency, a sound wave at a certain frequency to the inner and outer pipe wall. There's reflections that occur at the inner and outer wall. And then the difference in the time of flight is what's calculated back to a wall thickness based on the specific material. And this technology has been proven for, for decades. So the other technologies on board are the inertial measurement unit, which is basically a nine axis of rotation gyroscope that helps us with locating the main, showing the circumferential locations of the defects, joint deflections, and some other deliverables we provide. There's a magnetic field wave technology, which is a form of electromagnetics, which shows us wire breaks in non-cylinder reinforced concrete. And then we have hydrophones on board that uh, pick up leak noises. So what's the tool measure? So what exactly do all these different sensors do that are on board during this single inspection, again, with the pipe in service? So we get healthy wall thickness measurements on metallics. We get corrosion, obviously, on metallic type pipes. We can see leaching or H2S attack on asbestos cement or metallic pipes. We can see erosion or damage, for example, to the invert of a pipe. And we can see delamination between multiple layers. So for example, if you've got a force main or a water main for, any, for that matter with a cement lining or a epoxy lining and the lining's missing, we'll see that really clearly. But what's more important, if you've got H2S attack, that's the H2S gets converted to sulfuric acid in a force main application when there's air present. If that happens and undercuts behind the lining for say 500 feet in both directions from where you see a visible defect, we pick up that delamination very clearly as well. So we can show the extent of the damage and not just what's visible. So on the joints, Something else that's very critical, for example, with electromagnetic inspections, you can't see any information on about two feet of either side of either each joint because of the heavy armament. So we can see the deflection at every joint with the inertial measurement unit. We can also see the gap at every joint. So if a pipe joint start to separate, if you've got mortar that's supposed to be inside the joint that's come out, we can see that, that it's missing and no longer protecting the steel armament. 
We can also see if a PVC pipe has been telescoped, which means if the spigot was pushed past the home mark and too far into the bell, that causes stress on the plastic pipe and eventually causes it to fail prematurely. And we can measure that gap to determine if that's happened. Which Chris, you and I see that a lot, right? That happens more often than not with PVC pipe. Every single rehabilitation project we've done on PVC. Yeah. That we've opened up the pipe to cut a section out to do the rehab. If there's a joint, in that section we open up, they're always telescoped. Yeah. And that's not, this is not a bash on PVC comment at all. It's more of a, it's more of an installation issue um, and just training with installers and contractors mostly. 100%. If you look at, I dare to say 99% of the issues we uncover related to premature pipe failures are all construction related. And again, this isn't the fault necessarily of the crew installing the pipe. Right. It's, it's our fault as an industry for not doing a better job to educate people on how these things are supposed to be installed properly because PVC pipe installed properly can last a hundred years and never have a problem. It, it's been researched and written about. There's a paper that was done in Tucson a while back that basically shows that, that most of the failures occur over the first 30 years on PVC, for example, and it's all construction related trying to bend the pipe where you shouldn't be bending it, over deflecting joints to keep from putting fittings in that are more expensive, not being careful to not push the previous bell further into the, in, or spigot further into the bell when you push the next joint. So these things aren't things that are done intentionally. They're, right. they're just, they just occur because of lack of education and just in a lot of instances, poor oversight while these things are going in. So what's great about this, you could, for example, you could put a PVC pipe, like say you wanted to, you've got a critical 38 inch PVC pipe going down a major corridor. Everything's backfilled, compacted, the roadways put in. We can put this tool through a brand new PVC pipe and with the pipe in the ground, tell you every single joint that was over deflected, every single joint that was telescoped, anywhere you have ovality that, because the backfill wasn't compacted properly. We can see that before the pipe ever gets put in service and the contractor who installed it that didn't put it in per spec while they're still on site can be asked to go back and make those repairs. So the city doesn't end up having to pay for that five to 10 years down the road when the pipe ultimately fails prematurely. So uh, another question, the civil, what civil costs are involved in this? I don't know. I can't remember if you are addressing that later or if that's something we can talk about now. So again, mo most of the civil costs come down to improvements, right? So if, uh, for example, if a lift station is constructed without some sort of launch tube assembly or clean out assembly, it probably should have had that in the first place, but people weren't looking that far down the road when these were initially designed and constructed 30, 40 years ago. So if we're gonna perform an inspection today, a lot of these capital improvements can be made to the pipe that not only allow for inspection, but also allow the owner to, in the future, potentially, for example, pig or clean a line that they couldn't have done before if they didn't have a proper launch tube assembly. So the improvements, we try to keep separate from the inspection because they're a capital expense versus an OPEX expense or an inspection or asset management expense. But they're, and, and a lot of times these are minimal. You know, we, we just performed an inspection for uh, a client in the Midwest, 10 inch line, I've got some pictures of the launch tube assembly but they actually had a Y and a valve in their valve vault with a, a Y with a valve connected to it. So all we literally had to do was bolt up our launch tube, our pig launching tube, and we never took the pipe out of service. And then we capture it in the manhole downstream. And the capital, there was literally zero capital cost associated with it. And there was zero downtime on the lift station. We never turned the lift station off. So it just depends kind of project to project and how much foresight was put into the initial construction. So some of the other things that we're measuring, so we pick up ovality. So if there's poor backfill or differential settlement over time, we'll pick that up during our inspection as a percentage. 
um, we get a really accurate XYZ map. So we can not only map a pipe with our Aquarius tool, but we can also use basic uh, soft foam pigs with transducers in them to map your pipe if mapping is just a, a something that you're after. Um, that's within about a foot and a half of the pipe. And I can, I'll explain that a little bit later. We pick up leak noises, air pockets, debris in the pipe, and then uh, any axial bending or um, radial deformation. Axial deformation or radial bending, um, we can pick up as well if the pipe's been bent. So now that you know what we measure, how accurate is it? So our mapping is within about 1.6 feet of center of pipe. Our wall thickness measurements are within 0.49 millimeters. Our joint deflections are within a quarter of a degree. Our joint gaps are within 0.4 millimeters or just under like about a tenth of an inch. Ovality is within a half a percentage point. Axial deformation, we can see across a minimum of 0.2 meters of pipe. Um, leaks, all acoustic leak detection equipment re create, requires pressure and an audible signal. So we have to have about a 13 decibel sound to pick it up, but that's common across all acoustic leak detection equipment. So that's pretty typical. Um, air pockets, debris, and then again, wire breaks and non-cylinder reinforced concrete pipe. We pick up real clearly. So this is just a real quick video that kind of goes through a, a typical process. So this is the Aquarius tool. So you can see on the back, on the right, um, you've got a, a gauge disc, a gauge plate, and then you've also got the technology in the odometer wheels. So everything's housed in a, in a centralizer. You can see the front, you've got a cone that's got a hydrophone. Chris, while we're watching this video, how far can we push these tools in one run? So we've got about 12 hours of battery life on our data logger. So that's our limitation. So depending okay. on our flow rate, and usually we're trying to go about one to three feet per second. So you could get 10 to 20 miles of inspection completed in one run. Okay. So you can see our tracking sound on the back. Our UT sensors are in the hub with the black dots. That's the UT sensors themselves. The inertial measurement units <clears throat> inside, the data loggers inside, and it only takes up about a four inch diameter on the overall pig diameter. So that's why we're able to go around really complicated pipeline geometry, because this really isn't much different than putting a one pound, two pound, um, three pound density soft foam um, swab pig through a pipe. So never has been, never have we had one stuck in a pipe. We do have a very robust um, prevention procedure for if one were to get stuck, but we've never had one get stuck, but we do address that in our planning. So we track it with GIS locators from above ground. So then we launch through, this would be like a typical launch tube assembly. So before we perform the inspection, we'll lay out markers based on the client's GIS system. So we'll take their GIS coordinates, we'll load it into our GIS, we'll walk the entire alignment and put out markers, which are usually paint markers. We'll mark every fitting, and then we'll put a marker about every 300 feet. Then the first pig we put through the pipe is a cleaning pig, which we track, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we track that to actually dial in the exact location of the main. And we might run a couple of tracking cleaning pigs before we put a pilot pig in the final inspection pig with the tech on board. And I'll go through that here in a second. So we'll catch it in an outfall location. Like this is a force main, obviously. Um, if we had a water main, we would bring it into a structure or we could bring it into a pig receiving station. So there's lots, lots of different ways to capture this on the receiving side. So now you've seen what tech's on board, what each technology picks up or detects. Now what do we send you when we're done? So we'll provide a PDF 
executive summary report that goes through the tech, the work plan, all the anomalies that were detected during the inspection. We'll provide everything back in GIS shape files. So we'll take all the anomalies along the pipe alignment and where they're located. We'll drop those into shape files. We'll, we'll provide those back. We also provide all the raw measurements throughout the entire inspection. So all the joint deflections at every joint, vertical and horizontal, wall thickness measurements, averages for every half a meter of pipe, that all gets provided back to you. But what's most interesting and different about our deliverable is we also provide an HTML interactive map. And the HTML interactive maps are a real good way to, to share this with management, the board, to show them exactly what's wrong with your pipe. So we don't have a lot of time, so I'll kind of go through this a little bit quickly. So this shows an AC pipe inspection. For example, the red dots are where the pipe's in poor condition. You can click on one of these individual red dots. It'll pull up a 3D thermal image of that 1.6 feet of pipe and then show you exact clock positions of the degradation that's occurred based on the measurements captured. We also pick up the height profile, so you know the exact depth along the entire alignment. You can see on the bottom left that shows gas pockets inside and outside leaching, H2S attack, and of course the profile. This is a distribution of the joint deflections horizontally. You would also have that vertically. These are wall thickness measurements. This is your ovality measurements. So we do the cleaning runs. We do the final dummy run right before we run the inspection pig, which is set up exactly like the inspection pig, but make sure that the pig is going to travel successfully through the pipe. And then we run the final inspection. Um, each one of these we track. We always know where they're at in the pipe. We rarely have to take the pipe out of service. And we want to move about one to three feet per second. And we dial all that in through this process, running the pumps. Chris, I know we're running out of time. We have another question. Um, Cause you're in the beginning, we showed that we do offer multiple tools, but what, what, what would be different about the information or the data provided based on the tool that we would recommend for the inspection? And why would we recommend different tools? So the only, the, the primary inline inspection tool, and this just shows some of our launch retrieval setup um, that we did on this 10 inch force main recently that we didn't have to take out of service, but I'll flip past that. So the other tool we have is Aquabrella. The Aquarius tool you can use for water or wastewater. The Aquabrella is strictly for water because it flows with the water and you need the water to couple the sensors to the pipe. And actually these sensors are placed all the way out on the ends of the umbrellas, as you can see. Yeah. The only difference between this tool and the Aquarius from a data perspective is we can't get ovality because the Aquarius tool is on a centralizer. You have to have that those UT sensors stable at a set distance from the pipe wall to give you ovality. So with this, because the tool swims, the sensors are pressed right against the pipe wall. So you can't get that. Okay. And then, this can go into a much smaller outlet. So where the Aquarius could reduce down to about 35%, this tool, you can put a 96 inch tool through about a 24 inch top outlet. So it can go through a much smaller opening and it can do much larger like tran water transmission mains, for example. And then the final thing we were gonna just touch on real quick, pipe scanner. It's kind of, it's the same technology. It's ultrasound. It's uh, basically looks like a mouse, just like you can see here. You put it on the top of the pipe, you turn it on, you slide it down the pipe, you turn it off, and it captures thousands of wall thickness measurements on both metallic pipes and asbestos cement pipes. Uh, we have another question that just came in. Have you worked on any inlines underneath railroad crossings? Right. Um, it as example, retrofitting pipes to encase them. Retrofitting pipes to encase them. I haven't worked it. I mean, I have worked under railroad crossings when it comes to stormwater, uh, but not necessarily pipe inspection tools yet. Like using this tool on a pipe that's encased? I, I think that's the question, yeah. Oh yeah, if the pipes in case that won't really impact the inspection at all. Um, yeah, if if it's encasing or if it's encased in concrete, we're still getting measurements on the pipe 
wall itself, not anything really outside the pipe wall. So you you could have grout around it, you could have concrete around it, you can have backfill. It doesn't that really doesn't impact the data that we collect at all. So, so another question um I'm just thinking I have I can see <laughs> I have a couple of my contacts here with the Idaho Transportation Department. In what scenario and I had to ask you this this morning because I was like in what scenario would you see like a DOT because I've worked with a lot of these guys on stormwater on large culvert projects with snap tight and other product lines that I carry. Um, but in, would, would you see fitting a DOT or using this kind of technology for them? Well, here in Maricopa County, cause I'm in Phoenix, Arizona is where we're based out of, but in Maricopa County, like the Maricopa County department of transfer, the, the, the MDOT, they have a lot of booster pump stations around the city. So when we have major rain events and we have lots of flooding on the streets and that goes into the storm system, they have major pumping stations that, that push that water um, out to where they can control it versus on the streets. So the, they do have pressure pipes here, for example, in the county. Okay. Um, this, you know, these inspection tools, you know, you, you guys have the perfect ins inspection tool for a culvert pipe, right? You, walk through it. <laughs> yeah, it's us. <laughs> Cassie and Michael in boots and you walk through it. And yeah. it's everywhere. We need to push a new pipe inside of it. And you fix it. Yeah. So th this is all for long distances, complicated pipe geometries, you know, where you're trying to figure out where you've got, you know, a mile, two miles, 10 miles of pipe. You want to figure out where the problems are. And one thing worth mentioning is a lot of times we'll have somebody say, well, we just want to inspect a thousand feet under the freeway. Well, that, that's not really cost effective. What we want to do is we want to catch that thousand feet under the freeway while we're doing 10,000 or 20,000 feet from the starting point to the ending point of that pipe, because that's the cost effective way to get this done. And you're only going to spend about maybe 3% of the replacement cost to get this type of robust inspection performed and this really valuable data that can really dial in your, your repairs and your rehabilitation budgets. Yeah, and it's going to eliminate 85 to 90 percent of the pipe that you may have thought based on recent breaks needed to be repaired to replace. So if you if you take this approach from from a business case, you're going to take a, a say one hundred and fifty million dollar replacement cost on a 10 mile, 30 inch main down to eight, nine, ten million dollars immediate. And all the rest of that can be deferred till years in the future. So you're not going to have to spend 150 million in the next 10 years. You might have to spend 150 million over the next 70 or 80 years, and that's manageable. Awesome. So, little background to wrap up. I there's some names on here I'm definitely not familiar with on the webinar today. Um, so how Chris and I connected is, like I said, Pipe Reline Solutions is kind of a consulting distri distribution company. Um, myself and some of my employees, uh, Michael's based in Denver. I'm based here in Boise, Idaho. We act as a resource for you guys to figure out multiple different solutions when you guys are looking at pipe repair, um, hence why we brought the pipe inspection tool on. Uh, we cover, and this is just geographically where we my team can handle, but right now we cover eight states, um, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. So in any of those states, we kind of would be your go-to to help with getting information, getting quotes. Outside of that, Chris has a whole network of people like myself in other territories around the country, because I'm sure there's people outside of this territory on this call um, cause I have kind of a national database. I email you guys all when we're doing this, but with that said, you can reach out to myself, Chris, Michael, whoever, you know, or are familiar with, if you guys want more information on this or anything else that we do. Yep. And I just want to thank you again, Cassie. Yeah. Much better than the first time. If you were on the first <laughs> one we did, she said, okay, Chris is, is going to talk. And I thought we were just having a conversation. I didn't have anything prepared. So I, I'm prepared. <laughs> no, this is great. And we'll probably have to do another bullet liner one too, to follow up this, this conversation, but thank you guys. This is recorded. We will be sending out the link for the recording. If you want your CEU certificates, can you just shoot me an email? 
Uh, you guys should all have my emails from the invite and then I can get those made uh, myself or Bailey, my marketing coordinator will get those over to you guys within the next week. So thank you so much for your participation today.